Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Daily Express webinar entitled The Great Reset, here with Brian Balfour, the Senior Vice President of Research at the John Locke Foundation. For anyone who does not know me, my name is Winston Brady, and I'm the Director of Daily Express, and we put on these webinars really just to create an opportunity where students and teachers can come together, share ideas that make learning a joyful experience. All of us here are, to one extent or another, students. We're still learning. And uh, we have a really great opportunity today to learn about all of the changes that have been taking place since March of 2020 and the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak. So logistics, recording, a recording is going to be made available via our Thales Press YouTube channel, as well as our Thales podcast entitled Developing Classical Thinkers. Q&A will follow after the presentation, although Mr. Balfour may call on people while the presentation is ongoing. So be ready. I'm going to give a brief introduction of our speaker. Brian Balfour is a longtime friend and colleague. He's the Senior Vice President of Research at the John Locke Foundation, which is a Raleigh, North Carolina-based think tank. Um, he's also the author of an economics textbook entitled Economics in Action, which was published by Thales Press last spring. And we've had a lot of great success with that textbook. I've known Brian for upwards of 12 years now, and it's a joy to continue working with him and to work with him on this particular webinar. So Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And thank you everybody for, for attending and we look forward to a really enlightening and inspiring discussion. Great, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Winston. I appreciate uh, appreciate the introduction, appreciate the opportunity to uh, join y'all and thank you everybody who's joining online. Um, I hope that this discussion will be uh, enlightening and um, uh, that that I can kind of fill in the blanks and and hopefully answer a lot of questions about, about this issue called the Great Reset that I'm sure so many of you have been hearing about. And I want to try to, uh, one of the goals I have today is to try to separate fact from fiction and, and really uh, try to give you some information that you'll find useful um, uh, so you can be aware about uh, what some of these movements going on. So uh, just kind of a brief outline, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, I'm going to dive into them. Uh, you'll you'll uh, soon understand why. Uh, some of the key players that are involved in this whole great reset, um, COVID as an opportunity, Winston mentioned, um, you know, COVID is, was an op, they saw this as an opportunity to, to really ratchet up their efforts uh, of the great reset. Um, and and uh, the discussion really needs to uh, have a understanding of stakeholder capitalism. That's a key plank of the great reset. So we'll dive into that a little bit. Key components of the great reset. Uh, some of the main goals and uh, metrics and measures of the Great Reset. So those are some of the topics I, I want to dive into today. I, and uh, of course, hopefully trying to leave some time for questions towards the end uh, that I can try to help folks out. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And also uh, some likely outcomes, ramifications of if the Great Reset is implemented and some of their goals that they have, what that means for um, for you, uh, what that means for the uh, global economy. All right, so the Great Reset. Is this some grand conspiracy to reshape the global economy? You're saying, well, come on, is it time to put on the tinfoil hats or what's going on here? Uh, so what is this really all about? It does kind of sound like some grand conspiracy, but that's because kind of it is. Um, and uh, so I, as I go through this presentation, though, I, I'm not going to just, uh, you know, engage in wild-eyed conjecture. I'm going to be actually using quotes from from articles, from essays, from the the, the World Economic Forum themselves. Uh, so just straight from the uh, the source's mouth, if you will, uh, to to discover and and uh, share exactly what this is all about. Um, extraordinary opportunity to reset, accelerate efforts to improve the state of our world. So their their designs are are global in nature um, and very grand, and, um, uh, and and a lot of urgency um, coming through in that video as well. We need nothing short of a paradigm shift, action at revolutionary levels and pace. So they're not thinking small by any means. Uh, so you, you know, just really want to emphasize what their mindset is and what their what their thinking is when they when they are promoting this great reset. Um, big big plans, global in nature, uh, revolutionary in nature. The World Economic Forum. Why do I bring that up? 
or why do I bring up that group? Well, because they are the organization that is behind this effort called the Great Reset, known as the Great Reset. Uh, the World Economic Forum is the international organization. Uh, they're self-described as the international organization for public-private cooperation. The forum engages the foremost political, business, cultural, and other leaders of society to shape global, regional, and industry agendas. They have, uh, you may have heard of their annual meetings in uh, uh, Davos, uh, Davos, sorry, Switzerland, uh, where they really discuss and shape their agendas and priorities. Uh, but it's not it's not a new organization. In fact, it was founded 53 years ago. Um, and so some of these ideas have been have been uh, in in the design phase and and discussed for for decades. Uh, and uh, as as we'll see, uh, COVID was really a a uh, uh, an excuse for them to really double down on what they're doing and really try to exploit that opportunity uh, to make these grand changes that they're that they're talking about so much. All right, so who are some of the key players? This gentleman here on the right, um, he is an actual person that is not a character from a movie. He is not a movie villain. He is an actual person. His name is Klaus Schwab. Uh, he is the founder and executive uh, chairman of the World Economic Forum. Uh, so who is this guy? He's a German-born engineer and economist, highly educated. He's got multiple degrees, including a master's in public administration from Harvard, Harvard in 1967. Uh, so... Uh, although he does uh, choose to dress like a movie villain, he is a highly educated, very intelligent person, and he's very determined and has, uh, as we'll see, very grand designs on a global scale. Uh, who are some other key players in the World Economic Forum? So the Board of Trustees includes some uh, folks I'm sure you are all familiar with, former Vice President Al Gore, for example, Larry Fink, who's the chief executive of BlackRock. BlackRock, one of the largest investment firms on the planet. Uh, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, the president of the European Central Bank, the director of the World Trade Organization, uh, and heads of, heads of uh, major corporations, global corporations that uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard of, Siemens, Nestle, uh, the Carlyle Group, uh, AXA, the, the insurance uh, giant, Salesforce, so these are major, major players that are involved uh, with the World Economic uh, World Economic Forum. Some of the partners, uh, they count themselves as partners, a thousand plus corporations, national banks, large NGOs, which are non-government organizations, nonprofits uh, that, that help to shape public policies across the globe. Um, some of these companies that are partners uh, include, uh, you know, the largest corporations on the planet. Uh, of course, you're all going to be familiar with Amazon, Apple, Morgan Stanley, the Bank of China, uh, Fidelity, Pepsi, Coke, uh, Boeing, every major pharmaceutical company. So uh, the World Economic Forum, I mentioned, is 53 years old, and it has been growing, and and it has developed into an organization which, with, I mean, the most influential uh, people, government, uh, uh, people in government, and uh, global corporations. So highly, highly influential. Now, this is just, I just grabbed this here just as an example. These are partners. This is just a screenshot of uh, uh, the B, part of the B section um, uh, from the uh, uh, corporate partners for the World Economic Forum. And you can just, uh, you know, for example, see some of these major corporations, um, and we'll see uh, Black Rocks over there on the right-hand column. We'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more uh, shortly. Boeing, as I mentioned, Bloomberg's in there. Um, I'm not sure if it's showing up on your screen, but BP is part of it as well. The Bank of uh, Bank of America, the Bank of China is on there. So just major, major players on the global scale are part of this effort. So COVID as an opportunity, they talked about that. Um, COVID uh, as an opportunity for a great reset, uh, obviously with with global uh, uh, shutdowns and lockdowns and and uh, just such incredible um, uh, government intervention into the economy, into people's lives, they thought that was served as a great opportunity to really 
uh, ratchet up their efforts for this great reset. So, for example, and this is, again, this is directly quoted from the World Economic Forum. They say there is an urgent need for global stakeholders, and we'll learn a little bit more about what they mean by that word here in a, in a minute. Uh, urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in simultaneously managing the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, to improve the state of the world, the World Economic Forum is starting the Great Reset Initiative. Now, they're claiming they're starting the Great Reset, Ini Reset Initiative. Um, from my research, it, it sounds like the Great Reset actually has been an, an idea that's been around for decades. But I think they're really seizing on COVID and all the extreme uh, changes and actions taken on behalf of governments around the world to really uh, try to try to say that they are in, initiating this this uh, great reset initiative. Uh, here's what Klaus Klaus Schwab had to say: The COVID nineteen pandemic took so much from us in lives lost and livelihoods shattered, but it also presented us with an opportunity to reshape our global economy. And we overcame our pain and trauma to unite and seize the moment to secure a better future for all. It was the only thing to do, the only thing to do. So they're presenting this as the only option. No other alternatives were, were even fathomable uh, in, in the minds of the World Economic Forum and, and uh, Klaus Schwab. The pandemic presents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So again, there's a lot of those buzzwords they use in the video. Their, their designs are global in nature. They want to reimagine, reset our world. So, so I'll get to in a minute talking about what they really mean by reset. Uh, one final uh, quote here from, from uh, Schwab. Every country from the United States to China must participate, and every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. So those are some very big words there. <laughs> He's using every country, every country, no exceptions, every country must participate it's not an option you must participate every industry from oil and gas to tech every industry must be transformed it's not an option must be transformed so this is the kind of language uh, that they're using here for the great reset so what is the great reset let's get a little bit of uh investigating into what they mean by the great reset so the key component uh, of the Great Reset, or, or really the, the headline, if you will, of the Great Reset is they want a transformation from uh, what what uh, they call shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. We mentioned that term a, a minute ago, stakeholder capitalism. So we'll dive into that. So what do we mean by these terms? Shareholder capitalism, that's really the traditional model um, uh, of economics in which businesses' goal is to make profits, right? Um, the old Milton Friedman line, uh, uh, he used to say the business of business is business, right? And it was considered that uh, when businesses are making a profit, they're doing so by benefiting consumers uh, and that businesses that, that are serving consumers, they're offering people goods and services at a price they're willing to pay. And these consumers are, are doing so because uh, they feel those goods and services make their lives better. They, they value that good and service more than what they pay for that, for those products. Um, so, so businesses, by serving their consumers and creating value, uh, are de facto uh, benefactors of society. Uh, but that's not good enough uh, in the eyes of the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset. They want to shift to what they call stakeholder capitalism. And with stakeholder capitalism, as they describe it again themselves, uh, that asserts that an organization is accountable to all parts of society. Uh, meaning stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders uh, include the planet. <laughs> we'll, we'll touch on that uh, in a minute. Um, all people, you know, they talk about the public good and the well-being of all. So it's really, uh, quite frankly, the stakeholder capitalism is all-encompassing and a much more broader definition than the the kind of traditional shareholder capitalism uh, model um, that, that um, just talked about businesses serving their customers to make a profit. Uh, and, and one quote that I pulled, it's not on the screen, um, but uh, this is another quote from the World Economic Forum emphasizing the planet. It says, the planet is thus the center of the global economic system, and its health should be optimized in the decisions made by all other stakeholders. So, so they're really uh, centralizing uh, uh, what they consider to be the health of the planet and actions that businesses can take to um, 
to benefit or, or you know benefit the health of the planet or at least stop harming the planet. Uh, environmental issues like uh, CO2 reduction are prioritized in this great reset. Uh, of course, you saw some of that in the opening video as well. Um, now, I mentioned the World Economic Forum. It's it's uh, 53 years old, and this stakeholder capitalism that we're talking about as the key uh, component of the Great Reset, it's it's not a new idea. Um, Klaus Schwab actually takes credit for creating this uh, uh, stakeholder capitalism model more than 50 years ago. And this is uh, uh, from an essay, an article that Schwab wrote. He uh, taking credit for it. He, he he wrote, "Stakeholder capitalism is a model I first proposed a half century ago, uh, and it positions private corporations as trustees of society, and is clearly the best response to today's social and environmental challenges." So he he's saying that you know it was an idea he invented 50 years ago, but it's still even today the best response to the challenges. Uh, as he sees it, social and, and environmental uh, challenges confronting us today. The first uh, World Economic Forum meeting was back in 1971. Uh, that, again, is, is referring to those annual meetings in uh, uh, Davos, uh, Switzerland. Uh, in 1973, just a couple of years after the first meeting, attendees signed the Davos Manifesto, which, quote, describes a firm's principal responsibilities towards its stakeholders. So they're already back 50 years ago, the World Economic Forum, they were they were planting seeds of this great reset and trying to um, redefine what businesses' roles in society uh, are. Uh, one example was this, uh, they developed this code, quote unquote, code of ethics for professional management. Um, and, and among that code included the quote, humanization of the workplace. Uh, the serving of society and assuming, quote, the role of a trustee of the material universe for future generations. So, again, there's that term trustee, uh, you know, caretaker for for uh, the material world. Um, of course, at the time, the World Economic, World Economic Forum was pretty new, so this wasn't necessarily widely accepted. They didn't have a whole lot of partners to join in with this, uh, but they are very persistent. And over time, they started to see some payoffs. So, ooh, uh, I think I'm missing the slide. But uh, for example, we can talk about there's this organization. This isn't on the slide, but um, uh, the business, an organization called the Business Roundtable. That's an association that consists of more than 200 chief executive officers of America's leading companies uh, that collectively represent more than one fourth of America's gross domestic product. Uh, they're not a part of the World Economic Forum, but they're very influential. Um, and since 1978, they've issued their principles of corporate governance that included the purpose of a corporation. And since 1997, the stated purpose that they said that this business roundtable said was to serve to serve shareholders. The business, uh, uh, the purpose of a corporation was to serve shareholders, uh, of course, through pursuing profits. Uh, under the urging of the World Economic Forum, however. Those principles changed. The Business Roundtable changed those principles in 2019, changed that to serving all stakeholders. Now, there's that terminology again, including, quote, fostering diversity and inclusion and embracing sustainable business practices. So the World Economic Forum, uh, as you see, uh, over the years, gained more and more traction, more and more uh, influence. And here's just one example of this of this very influential Business Roundtable a uh, group of CEOs in America starting to adopt the language and the outlook of the uh, the Great Reset and World Economic Forum. So we we discussed uh, the 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 shift from uh, uh, shareholder to stakeholder capitalism. But what are what are some more com main components of the Great Reset? You know, what are some kind of get down to some some more of the details of what they mean by this transition? So uh, there's three more components. One of the uh, the first main component is steering the market toward fair, as they describe it, fair outcomes. Uh, that's that's uh, really kind of code for income equality, trying to drive towards more more income equality. Um, you know, they, they uh, want to do this towards greater government intervention for wealth redistribution, basically, which is going to involve taxes, regulatory fiscal policy. Uh, also to promote global equity, equity, of course, meaning uh, uh, equal outcomes of income of, and, and wealth, and they want to try to promote that globally, not just you know within specific 
uh, countries, but globally. So, um, uh, and that's going to involve wealth taxes on the wealthier nations, trade restrictions, uh, uh, obviously some, I'm sure it would involve uh, wealth redistribution uh, globally as well. So the second second main component is to ensure investments, you know, business investments, or I'm sorry, uh, investments. When they're talking about investments here, it's not business investments, but it's government spending. So just to kind of clarify here what they're talking about. So ensure investments, i.e. government spending, pursue, quote, shared goals of equality and sustainability. Um, and so what we're talking about here is massive government spending programs like we saw during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, there's there's a reason they were referring to the the COVID nineteen pandemic and the lockdowns. Um, they really thought that started to provide a template for um, you know massive government programs to try to accomplish their goals. Uh, of course, uh, next up or, or also included in that is funding for quote unquote green urban infrastructure and to incentivize ESG scores. We'll touch on that in a minute. A lot of you have probably heard about that terminology ESG as well. Uh, now, uh, the third main component is to harness the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution to support the public good. Uh, now, that might be a term, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, a term that's that's kind of new to some of you. Uh, basically, what they're referring to here is the uh, they look through history and the economic progress uh, of the world as having gone through three industrial revolutions. Um, the 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 last most significant one being what most of us would just consider the industrial revolution of about 100 120 to, to 40 years ago um, and and they would argue that we're now in the process of experiencing a fourth industrial revolution and so they want to ha uh, harness this for what they can would call the quote public good so what what are they talking about with the fourth industrial re revolution that's really revolutionizing the the global economy but well, we're talking about what we're seeing, rapid tech, uh, technological advancements, including artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, nanotechnology, biotech, uh, energy storage, quantum computing. Uh, more specifically, some examples of what they're talking about would be like self-driving cars, um, AI assistance, uh, drones, uh, even you know, software that makes investments for you. Um, and so what they want to do... Uh, when they're talking about harnessing the innovations of this fourth industrial revolution is is really largely boils down to they want in large part they want to guard against growing inequality that could be caused by tech um you know like the divergence between high tech and low tech jobs um how they want to do that uh, of course involves massive government entitlement programs job programs just more centralized control of the economy Okay, so who we keep hearing this term stakeholders, right? Uh, stakeholders, stakeholder capitalism. Uh, so when they're referring to stakeholders, um, I kind of mentioned it previously, stakeholders kind of, <laughs> they give the impression that they're basically stakeholders of just everybody, everything, everywhere, all the time. And well, that, that, that's kind of right. That's kind of true. So to execute their plan, uh, the World Economic Forum identified four key stakeholders and their role. So let's let's walk through that. Obviously, government's been talking about that quite a bit, national, state, and local. So so governments at all levels. Um, and, and so what do they envision government's role being? Well, quote, uh, focusing on creating the greatest prosperity for the greatest number of people. So that's really code word for what we were talking about a minute ago, income and wealth redistribution. Um, so national, state, and local governments involved in trying to, um, you know, Redis redistribute uh, income and wealth to try to try to equalize outcomes there. Uh, and then they say another stakeholder is what they call civil society that would com be comprised largely of those NGOs, non-government organizations I mentioned, uh, labor unions, schools, act other various activist groups, uh, and what they envision the role for these 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 groups they call civil society uh, to quote advance the interests of its constituents and to give a meaning or purpose to its members. Basically, what they're talking about is political activism, advancing propaganda, uh, and of course, um, to to do so. Or I'm sorry, the goal of of this political activism is to advance and promote the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum's goals. So they really want to try to um, 
uh, garner the the efforts of of these civil society organizations. Uh, and then there's companies, uh, especially global corporations. They see a, obviously a huge, huge role for global corporations. They're not real big fans of small, you know, family-owned businesses uh, as part of the Great Reset. Uh, we'll touch on that here in a, in, a, in a few minutes as well. But uh, so, what do they see? The role for these big global uh, corporations? Uh, they kind of the term the, for the phrase they use is profits. It's okay to turn profit in the short run, but make sure there's long-term value creation. Uh, they're really talking about um, sustainability. Um, and, and by that, it's, you know, transitioning to, uh, quote unquote, green re renewable energy. Um, they, they really want to see uh, an overhaul of how energy is used by companies. Um, and then, uh, and then lastly, uh, it didn't, it didn't get separated by the bullet point, but the last, the fourth key state key stakeholder there is at the bottom the international community, um, they consider that groups like the uh, the UN, United Nations, uh, the European Union, um, uh, with with the overarching goal to preserve peace. So, what are some of the the stated goals and some of the measures um, that the World Economic Forum uh, has set for the Great Reset, um, and and measures metrics um, that they want to use to determine if uh, if they are accomplishing these goals. So the World Economic Forum has uh, developed a set of 21 core and 34 expanded metrics. Uh, they did that in September of 2020. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to uh, uh, list and outline each one of those. Uh, there's four main categories there, um, uh, and they largely align with, with the ESG. And so these four categories are people, planet, uh, prosperity, and principles of governance. So what do we mean by by that? So these are these are again these are these are um, things that they're going to try to measure if their goals are being met or, or if they're succeeding in their goals. Uh, so the category of people, what do they mean by that? Well, they want to look at racial and gender quotas uh, of employees for for the various companies, uh, pay equity between racial and gender groups, um, the amount of training provided uh, also to uh, to employees. So so a lot of um, you know, looking at e again equal outcomes for pay amongst racial and gender groups uh, in in companies for employees. You know, making sure there's equal representation uh, amongst employees. So that that's one measure that they would um, consider uh, as part of their goals. Uh, the planet. We, we, I mean, we we've talked about this a, a couple of times. The planet is again their version of protecting the planet and the environment is is central to their to their goals. Um, you know, specifically commitments to greenhouse gas emissions, lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, they're going to measure companies' actual greenhouse gas usage, water usage, uh, things of that nature. Um, with uh, a big part of big, a big component of that, of course, you know, trying to transition to uh, so called clean energy or green energy like solar and wind. Um, uh, unfortunately, of course, those. Those sources of energy are far, far less efficient than the than the traditional fossil fuel based energy. So uh, that becomes problematically a problematic, problematic, especially in third world and, and poor developing countries. Um, you know, they just simply cannot afford to try to try to put up uh, solar and wind farms when they desperately need the cheap, reliable energy that that fossil fuels provides. Uh, the next one, uh, the next category, prosperity, um, and and by that they're referring to some of the measures they're looking at is employee turnover by race and gender. Again, um, you know, kind of bean counting people by by uh, their their groups. Um, percent of revenue from products designed for a quote social benefit. Total tax remittances. I thought that was kind of interesting. So they, um, you know, they they consider it a good thing. When companies are paying a lot of taxes, like a bigger share uh, of their revenue going to taxes, uh, which from their perspective, of course, makes sense because they envision such a huge, massive role for governments uh, in this great reset. So they want to make sure that uh, governments are maximizing revenue from from companies and, and uh, corporations. Lastly, is principles of governance. Uh, what they mean by that is racial and gender makeup. Uh, there again, we get we get to the identity politics. Uh, racial and gender makeup of corporate governance. Um, you know, is is there 
uh, sufficient, in their view, sufficient uh, representation of, of various uh, genders, racial groups uh, in the corporate governance of, of these corporations. Uh, also, they look at how important uh, are ESG factors when allocating capital um, uh, of investment firms. You know, they want to take ESG into consideration. We'll touch on that uh, a little more in a minute here. Uh, and public policy activism. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you noticed that, you know, quote unquote, woke corporations um, becoming more politically active in, in their ad campaigns and, and, and uh, more publicly taking stances on public policies. Well, that that's part inspired by this great reset, uh, right? And and ESG factors because they get rewarded for public policy activism and and taking public stands on on certain on certain uh, issues. And of course, they need to be on one side of those issues if they're to be rewarded uh, by these measures. Okay, so. We discussed uh, the key component, key components of the Great Reset, um, the goals uh, of it, uh, the stakeholders um, identified the stakeholders of the Great Reset. Um, but what would be some of the impact? What would be some of the ramifications if they were to be successfully implementing their plans? I mean, they're already having significant, significant influence uh, in the global economy. But what are some of the ramifications if they continue to uh, advance their uh, their great re great reset designs. Well, one is economic stagnation and poverty. and and these are actual quotes I'm going to show you here that that really kind of blew me away and led me to to this conclusion. This is a quote from the World Economic Forum it says, the greatest threat to the world is affluence. So think about that for a minute. Lifting people out of poverty, people, gaining greater financial security and, and 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 just affluence you know spreading around the globe and and, and uh, affording people better lives they consider that a great threat to the world uh now i would speculate you know what they're talking about there is um you know greater economic activity and greater wealth means greater consumption and and, and um in in their view threats to the uh, uh the environment and the planet uh, but, you know, if if you're in a developing nation and you're seeing this huge, globally uh, uh, impactful uh, organization talking about affluence being a threat to the world, I would be very, very concerned. Uh, another quote, they said, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing if growth slows to a crawl during a stable economic period. So Think about that economic growth slowing to a crawl. What does that mean? What does that mean for people? What does that mean for people trying to feed their families? What does that mean for, um, you know, the abundance of of uh, food and various things? Um, uh, just just very kind of stunning. Uh, these quotes uh, that they're that they're uh, showing on here. You know, growth, economic growth slowing to a crawl. What does that mean for the for the nation or our nation and the world's poorest people? If there's no growth. How are these people going to ever improve their 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 um, you know economic station in life? Uh, so very concerning, very concerning. There. Um, what are some other ramifications? Well, the World Economic Forum can can turn into a de facto one world government of economic planning, and I think they've already taken great strides in that uh, already. Um, and here's a quote from the Bank of America CEO, uh, you know, a partner. To the World Economic Forum, Bank of America CEO Brian uh, Moynihan, he said, uh, referring to compliance with ESG and and these Great Reset um, goals, he said, uh, compliance will be rewarded, not com non compliance will be punished. Specifically, he said he referred to companies not meeting the ESG standards will be quote left behind. So what does that mean, left behind? Well, that means they'll be denied access to capital. So if you're a business and you need capital to borrow money, you know, to grow your business. If you're not adhering to these great reset uh, uh, metrics and goals, you, guess what? Your access to capital is going to be dried up. You're not going to be able to grow your business. Uh, also, also, what could happen is uh, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, helps develop a corporate state hybrid. Unaccountable to constituents of national governments. 
I mean, with big business, big business and big government in bed together, who will stop them? Right. So, so it'll be this corporate state hybrid. They'll be, they'll be global in nation. Uh, I'm sorry, global in nature. And so individual nations, individual national governments will be, will be kind of useless to, to fight against it. And this, I, I mentioned this again, as uh, uh, previously, when I mentioned uh, small businesses are, are not really uh, part of their plans. Uh, this is a term they use fragmentation. So they use, this is the term they use at, at their Davos um, uh, meetings and, and some of the World Economic Forum folks talk about this fragmentation. They view that as a threat, right, to their goals. Uh, fragmentation refers to basically, um, number one, those companies and businesses not in lockstep with their goals, uh, and but also more specifically, small scale ownership of businesses. You know, to them, consolidation is the solution. A lot of you may have heard about Bill Gates buying up farmland across across the country, across the United States. You know, that is something they view as a good thing, right? They they want these huge corporate conglomerates, these these billionaires like Bill Gates, um, consolidating more and more uh, of these of these resources, more and more of the economy's resources and productive resources, um, because when when the economy is consolidated into fewer hands, then that means they're easier to control. So, you know, they, they want to see people like Bill Gates who are on board with their agenda, uh, buying up, uh, you know, all buying out all these small farmers and consolidating the farmland. So they, so they know that they're in the hands of someone who's going to follow along with their goals. Um, other ramifications, uh, th and this is one example that took place, I think, uh, in the spring uh, earlier this year. But uh, one example was the Dutch government uh, banned nitrogen fertilizers for sustainability purposes. That was all, all about the Great Reset, all part of the Great Reset, right? Ramifications, some estimates at the time said that more than 11,000 farms would have had to close because of that because they're taking away their primary means, uh, their affordable means to fertilize their, their farms and, and grow their crops. Um, and that picture, the pictures there to the right, uh, those are pictures of Dutch farmers um, uh, forming protests to this, trying to fight back against it because that would take away their livelihoods. But then what would be the result if all these small farmers had to give up their farms? Guess what? People like billionaires like Bill Gates can come in and swoop in and buy up all that farmland. So that gets back to the consolidation we were talking about. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, <laughs> this this is real. A lot of you may have heard and thought this was just kind of a joke. Uh, you know, the meme going around, you will own nothing and you will be happy. But it's not a joke. You'll notice, I, oh gosh, it might be cut off on the screen, but this is literally the World Economic Forum is posting this. Um, you will own nothing and be happy. This is our world could change by 2030. I mean, they are not hiding it. They're openly promoting it. Um, they think that that you know this gets back to the consolidation and and uh, going against the uh, the fragmentation. Um, they they want don't want individuals like you and me owning things. They want things to be owned, consolidated by these big uh, corporations. So if you're not going to own anything, who will? Well, let's go back to that screen. You'll see us circled in red. One example, one one uh, group that's going to be owning things is BlackRock. And so let's look at some recent um, recent headlines. For example, here's why BlackRock or State Street or Vanguard will be your kid's landlord. You know, Wall Street purchasing thousands of single family homes. Um, institutional investors uh, buying up, uh, you know, controlling more and more uh, of our housing. Uh, uh, BlackRock, other investment firms buying up homes. Why the road is getting... Uh, even rockier for first-time home buyers. Uh, there, that's an article even talking about Charlotte, North Carolina. So, you know, these huge corporate conglomerates uh, are are trying to buy up homes, and that's part of the plan. They want us to become renters. They want us paying money to these huge consolidated um, uh, multinational corporate conglomerates. Um, that's part of their plan. Uh, and speaking of memes out there. Eating bugs, yes, it's a thing. It's a real thing. They're actually talking about it. They're actually promoting it. 
Uh, here's just one example I grabbed. I mean, just Google search, you'll see tons and tons of articles trying to <laughs> trying to convince people that it's a good thing to eat bugs. Here's a quote. Uh, There's an unsung category of sustainable and nutritious protein that has yet to widely catch on. Insects. Insects are an excellent alternative source of protein and significantly reduce our carbon footprint. So y'all ready to eat the bugs to help out Klaus Schwab? Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, this is a really fascinating conversation. Um, as far as the, uh, the the PowerPoint, the recording, uh, we make these available on a YouTube channel and a podcast that we manage. Um, people who registered, I can email you guys once it's out and help put you in contact with Mr. Balfour. Um, he's got one uh, lecture on YouTube already from our conference last year on inflation. Great title. The Creature from Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend uh, finding that on YouTube if you want to check out more of Mr. Balfour's work. Um, so, Brian, thank you so much again right. for, for joining us on this webinar and educating us on this really valuable topic. So until next time, for Daily's Press, I'm Winston Brady. Stay classy and stay classical.